Hi, my name is Scott Shapiro, and I'm delighted to be at Enigma 2021 talking to you about Is Cyber War Legal? A 400 Year Retrospective. Imagine you wake up tomorrow morning, you reach for your phone, you open Twitter, and you find out that hackers have taken down Pentagon's military networks. New tweets start to appear in your timeline. Hackers have triggered explosions at oil refineries all around the country. They're releasing chlorine gas from chemical plants. They've grounded all airplanes by disabling air traffic control. Then at noon, find out that the New York Stock Exchange has been hit and all trading has ceased. Even worse, the trading records and their backups have been altered. By dinner, they have plunged the entire country into darkness by disabling the power grid. At midnight, Iran claims responsibility for these attacks as retaliation for the, econo for the crippling economic sanctions levied on their country by the United States. Now, the question I would like to consider is, would these attacks be legal? Would Iran have violated the laws of war in compromising US digital networks. Now there's no question that it would have been illegal for Iran to bomb US power plants, chemical factories, stock exchanges. As we'll soon see, traditional war, which is often called kinetic war, is illegal both according to international law, US domestic law, and the domestic law of most states. Kinetic war was outlawed in 1928 but cyber war obviously did not exist in 1928. So what I would like to know is, did the outlawry of kinetic war outlaw cyber war as well? That's the question I'd like to talk with you today. But before I do so, I wanna take you on a seven minute tour of the right of war over the last four centuries. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide the survey into two parts from 1600 to 1928, what I will call the old world order, and from 1928 to the present, what I will call the new world order. So let us begin in 1625, way before the advent of cyber attacks with the Dutch humanist and lawyer Hugo Grotius the so-called father of international law, who set out a theory of war which would become the orthodoxy around the world for the next 300 years. According to Grotius, war is a legitimate way for states to remedy wrongs done to them. Now, Grotius did not reserve war simply for cases of self-defense alone to repel invasions or attempted conquests. He thought that states could go to war for any legal violation whatsoever. So to collect for damages done to property, to collect debts, to resolve dynastic disputes, to deal with violations of treaties, to collect stolen property, protect freedom of the seas, and even to punish crimes. Any legal wrong was a casus belli, a legal cause of war. For centuries, kinetic war was the legitimate way that states resolved their disputes. War, in other words, in other words, was legal. Legal is a last resort. After all, negotiations have failed, but legal nonetheless. Going to war was like going to court, but instead of beating the other side in argument, you tried to beat the other side to death. Now, the legality of kinetic war had many legal implications, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about two of them, the right of conquest and the prohibition on economic sanctions. First, the legal right of conquest. If a state had the legal right to wage war in order to correct legal wrongs, then the law also needed to give states rights to keep what it took. Other words, otherwise the war would be not be serving its purpose. So the United States went to war with Mexico in 1846 and conquered 500,000 square miles of Mexican territory in 1847, 1948. And it justified that 
because it was collecting $4 million in debts that Mexico owed the United States, which it in fact did, conquering, going to war and conquering land was a standard thing to do in the old world order, as shocking as it may seem to us today. The second implication of states having the legal right of war is that economic sanctions by neutral states on belligerents were illegal. That is, if a neutral favored one belligerent over another, giving it favorable trading terms, for example, that would be an act of war because it would be interfering with the belligerents, with the disadvantaged states' right to wage war with the other belligerent. What we take to be completely uncontroversial, refusing to trade with another country because it started a war, was illegal for much of modern history. So therefore, when Great Britain and France uh, were waging war against each other in the late 18th century. The United States had to decide whether to help France, repayment for its help during uh, the Revolutionary War. They wanted to give favorable training terms to forgive um, legal debts. The cabinet ultimately decided that to favor France over Great Britain would be an act of war and would be legally perilous and decided not to. If you have ever seen Hamilton or listened to the soundtrack, this is the issue in the in Cabinet Battle 2, the question of whether economic sanctions would be a form, would be an act of war. So just to recap, in the old world order, war was legal, economic sanctions by neutrals, illegal. And this will all change. It changes in 1928. On August 27, 1928, the leaders of the great nations assembled in Paris to outlaw war in a treaty often called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, Kellogg after the Sec American Secretary of State Frank Kellogg and Briand, Aristide Briand, the French foreign minister, who uh, both who organized and coordinated the effort. And the Kellogg-Briand Pact overturned the Groschen theory of the legitimacy of war as a way of resolving disputes. Whereas war had been the main enforcement mechanism that states used in the Old World Order, the Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed it. States would no longer be able to resort to force in order to enforce their rights. Always, with the exception of self-defense, states always retain the right to repel um, imminent or actual attacks. So the Article 1 of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, it's actually very, very short, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, um, and the, the main article is Article 1, the high contracting parties condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy in their relations with one another. This outlawry of war, is embodied in the United Nations Charter, uh, ratified by the United States in uh, 1945 uh, in Article 2.4, which states that all members shall refrain from the threat or use of force. Now, the outlawry of war in the old world order dramatically changed it. it affected how all the other legal rights were treated. So in the New World Order, with the outlawry of war being operative, all the legal rights have to shift around it. Let me just talk very briefly about the two I talked before, conquest and economic sanctions. So in 1931, when Japan invaded Manchuria, virtually no state would recognize the conquest because after all, they had all signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact, removing the legal right of war. So as before, in the old world order, states had a legal right of conquest. In the new world order, there was no longer a right of conquest. Similarly, whereas before in the old world order, economic sanctions were illegal. In the new world order, economic sanctions are legal. It, economic sanctions are the main way, in fact, that states have for enforcing their rights against one another. 
So now I would like to return to the main question of my talk. How do cyber attacks fit into the new world order and its outlawry of war? To address this question, I'd like to pose another question, which I think is central to resolving it, which is, are cyber attacks more like kinetic war, in which case they would be illegal, or more like economic sanctions, in which case they would be legal? Now, to answer that question, I want to ask, why are kinetic war, why is kinetic war illegal? Well, you can think of two reasons. One is that kinetic war is normally extremely violent. There's normally great death and destruction. And this is an evil that states were keen to eliminate. And secondly, kinetic war is the active harming of one state to another. One state attacks, bombs, invades another state's active harming. By contrast, economic sanctions are legal because they're nonviolent and they are a form of passive harming. By passive harming, what I mean is what the state, instead of doing something to another state, like in kinetic war, that when a state imposes economic sanctions, it is merely refusing to do something with another state. So instead of doing something to another state, the state is simply refusing to cooperate with uh, another state or states. So what we can do is we can take these, these two reasons and we can create a two by two matrix where the rows are violent versus nonviolent attacks and the columns are active versus passive. And we can see that kinetic war is illegal because it's in the top left-hand corner. Kinetic war is both violent and active, whereas economic sanctions are nonviolent and passive. Let's now move on to cyber attacks. How do they fit into the matrix? Well, once we try to fit cyber attacks into this matrix, we see that the reason why it's been so difficult to analyze cyber attacks is that they don't neatly fall into either top hand left, top left or bottom right, but populate all four cells of the matrix. Let's take the easy cases first. Consider cyber attacks that have the same effects as kinetic war. If Iran were to blow up chemical plants by exploiting vulnerabilities in industrial control systems, these attacks would satisfy the same conditions that make kinetic war illegal. They would be violent and active. They would go in the top left-hand corner. Take another easy case. Suppose the United States decided to erect a giant internet firewall and prevent any packets coming from Iran from entering the country's digital networks. This too would be straightforward, legally speaking, because the firewall would block, simply block incoming packets. It would be nonviolent. And because it would be a refusal to interact with another country, it would be passive. Hence, the firewall would be akin to economic sanctions and hence legal. So top left hand is red because it's active and violent. Bottom left and right hand is blue because it is passive and nonviolent. Now, questions about the legality of cyber war are different, are difficult, as I suggested before, because the legal framework for analyzing war was developed during the world wars when kinetic war was on everyone's mind. That is where violence and active harming went hand in hand. But cyber attacks often pry these condition, two conditions apart. Cyber attacks are often nonviolent and some are passive. So how should we think about them? Now, I would suggest that we not think about them in terms of the laws of war. That is, it, the cyber operations in the top left and the bottom right, they can be analyzed according to the laws of war. However, the ones on the bottom left and the top right, the anomalous cases, the hybrid cases, 
they should not be analyzed according to the laws of war, which were developed with kinetic war in mind. Does that mean that, that the law has nothing to say about them? Well, I would suggest that, in fact, there are norms, central norms of international law, which uh, can regulate these hybrid cases. Uh, in particular, the norm of non-interference. States are committed not to interfere with the internal affairs of each other's uh, domestic operations. So for example, when the United States fomented a coup against uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Mostek in 1953 to install the Shah of Iran, the United States was uh, violating the norm of non-interference in Iran's uh, domestic affairs. And when Vladimir Putin uh, orchestrated, approved the attacks on the DNC in 2016, the Russian Federation was violating the norms of non-interference against the United States. So the suggestion is that cyber attacks that interfere with essential government functions violate the norm of non-interference and are therefore illegal. And what would be interference with essential government functions? Well, I imagine interference in elections, utilities, the financial system, these would be the types of interference which have traditionally been understood as being illegal under the norm of non-interference. Now, you may say, well, well, that's all well and good, but how would we enforce this? I mean, after all, there is no Supreme Court of the world and there is no global national security agency. Well, I would like to suggest that we use the bottom right-hand corner, that is the denial of other states to use one's own digital networks. So here would be the plan. The plan would be to form what I call cyber clubs. Member states would agree to certain cyber norms and would enforce these norms by threatening to expel or reduce access to networks to those members of the club who do not abide by the rules and those members of the club, uh, those non-members of the club who cannot abide by certain minimal obligations. Who can imagine slowing down access, reducing access, and in cases of repeated or, severe, or, or um, uh, severe violations, complete exclusion from the network. I would like to thank uh, my colleague and co-author, Professor Arna Hathaway, uh, uh, who um, helped uh, develop the framework for thinking about the history of the laws of war in a book called The Internationals that we wrote together and was published in 2017 and who helped me think through the application of this history to the to cyber attacks and to Professor Daniela Oliveira, uh, my Sherpa, who, and one of the organizers of, the, uh, of, of Enigma for uh, helping me greatly um, develop this uh, talk. Thank you very much.